it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, yeah, have the opportunity to give a bit of Frontex views <coughs> on, on the European Border and Coast Guard proposal. I wanted to start as a bit of a, if I can say, disclaimer that uh, I'm going to concentrate on the proposal as the Commission made it and not on the current text that is being worked to in the negotiation of the political process. As you can imagine, this is quite a sensitive topic at this moment and it's not my role. I'm representing an operational agency. I'm not a policy maker or representative of any of the EU institutions. But now the, the colleague from the Dutch presidency, Mr. Sorel, already left, but to say that the Dutch presidency has made an amazing work and effort in, in bringing forward this proposal, as he said, four months to get the council position is, is quite already on the, on the commission proposal, is quite an achievement. <clears throat> For uh, today and my, and my presentation, I wanted actually to, before going and explain what is, from our perspective, the main components or features of the, of the commission proposal, I wanted to give you first a, a bit of an intro of the situation at external borders, in particular what happened last year. Because I think you have to put the Commission proposal in context. This is no other way. You have to understand in which context the proposal is. And that's very much also Mr. Sorel um, referred to it in. You have to look at the bigger picture and the situation because you cannot work only in one side with one policy instrument. That's important and that's a main message that probably will repeat again. When we look at the situation at the external borders, particularly what we have seen last year, the first thing that, I mean, strikes us, and I think that we have to bear, have very present also in Frontex, is the high number of irregular border crossings we have seen. Last year we had 1.8 million irregular border crossings. If you compare it, for instance, to the figure of 2014, which is 285, you see almost a six-fold increase. That gives you a clear example of what is the pressure that is having for the border guards or the border management community at the external borders last year and what has to be dealt with. You have also to see, as Europol uh, mentioned several times, that 90% of the irregular border crossings are uh, actually facilitated. There are criminal networks behind sometimes, not some other times, but they are facilitated in any case. How many persons really arrived? Well, you know, as I think Karin was saying at the beginning, there is very important the registration and identification. So nobody is really sure about the exact number. We are talking about around 1 million. Hmm? Because we're talking about 1.8 million because our regular border crossings means people try to enter or enter irregularly. But we are to probably also doing double counting. That's why the figure sometimes you see 1.8 versus 1 million of people. All right. <clears throat> Uh, but there are other elements that tells us, uh, gives an idea about the pressure to external borders, like, for example, the cases of refusal of entry or document fraud that you see at external borders. In this case, the numbers were very similar to 2014, and that shows you that maybe the border management community is a bit at the limit, you know, they, because the, the other cases which show infringements or, or illegal activities at the borders, those indicators remain quite uh, the same for 2015 and 2014. I'm certainly not going to talk about asylum, but you know, as I said, asylum, border management, return, migration management are all very linked. And of course, this was, when I say, when I refer to the irregular border crossing numbers, I mean, we have a parallel case with asylum applications. We had a huge number of asylum applications, an increase with the last year, and that raises also issues about, in particular, the external borders, on the capacity, on the capacity to manage that inflow and of asylum seekers to refer them and also basically that they were and we saw processing gaps. So capacities for processing all those people at external borders were not there. So that was one of the main issues. We have seen them particularly in the Greek islands, but I think also in some of the final destination of asylum countries. So the crisis not only at external borders or the challenges. Uh, we have also seen, uh, to look very much at the field of return, where actually the mandate of the agency is being extended. And even the return, and also the, the, the presidency just put that very clearly, uh, if we look at the detections of irregular third country nationals in the, in the EU, we had a huge increase. We went from uh, 400,000, around 424,000 on 2014 to 700, 
around 700,000 detections of irregular third country nationals in the territory. <clears throat> but the return decisions, if you compare the, the, the number of return decisions between 2014 and 2015, they're around the same. We're talking about 250 versus 280,000 return decisions. What gives the impression is that the, the, the capacities in the member states to hunt the flows and also return those that who not, have not right to stay are a bit stretched. That's, that's clear because we have seen a bigger number of irregular border crossings. We have seen a bigger number of people, third country national residing in the, or residing or staying in the EU. But we have seen that the return decisions and the number of return decisions remain flat. And even there is also a gap between actually return decisions and the effective number of returns. And there we go down to around 160,000, uh, 170,000. If you look at those return, effective returns in 2015 compared to 2014, we we'll see the numbers are again very similar. Again, showing how much, you know, despite of some factors that would indicate you that the return performance would have to increase, they remain a bit flat in that sense, or the same. <clears throat> I think that, and of course, it's not a question about mixing things, but we have also to talk about the terrorist threat. Because the foreign fighters uh, uh, phenomena is something, well, maybe existed before, but has certainly acquired a com complete new dimension in the last years. And it presents particularly a huge challenge for the border guard community. And why that? Uh, first of all, we are talking about a large number of suspects. According to Europol figures, we are talking about 3,000, 5,000 people, EU citizens. And that's a particular challenging fact because, of course, the controls, as you know, for EU citizens at external borders are not the same as third country nationals. And the border guards somehow also have the important task of trying to prevent the exit or entry of those people. And that just added, so we have on one hand an important migration, asylum, mixed flows at external borders, but we have also internal security threats. And that adds to the complexity of the situation. And last element is the economic crisis. As I said, we cannot take things in isolation. If we look at, in particular, the most affected member state, Greece, we have seen that certainly the economic crisis has weakened the member state, that member state, and has left it with less resources, less capacity, to deal with a crisis. Because the first thing is that when you have a crisis situation, you need spare capacity, you need extra capacity from the different sectors, because they are also, of course, not only public sector and administration, probably also, certainly also NGOs, of course, the EU agency supporting and the EU institutions. But that spare capacity was difficult to find, and, and it was, and it because, particularly also because countries like Greece, but also Italy, are very much exposed. It's very simple. You look at the, car, at the map, and you will see how close the Greek islands are from the Turkish coast. So, and you see it, that, that exposure is, is an important element and explains also why it is so difficult actually also to handle with the flow and control the borders. So, and in part of, just from the landscape and context, and then I go straight to the proposal to summarize, I think it's fair always to ask what sort of crisis we are dealing with. Do we deal with a migration refugee crisis? Yes, certainly. But in, in certain way, if we look at the big numbers, at the macro numbers, we're talking about maybe one, people, uh, one million of people who arrived in an area of 500, around 500 million inhabitants, residents or citizens. We also look at, and there is an interesting OECD recent report that spends, explains that the, the, the cost or the um, yeah, the financial impact for the member states, the EU member states, for the refugee crisis is around 0 0.1, 0 0.2 of the global GDP. Of course, some member states like Sweden are much higher, but it is rel relatively low as average. Yeah? I think it's also fair to ask ourselves what has been the impact of the EU external relations or enlargement policy? Because, as it was said, the internal external dimension is important. If you look at particularly how far our neighborhood policy has been able to really do what it has to do, it means development, stability in the neighborhood area. And it would come in particular to the enlargement countries, where so much effort of the EU has been put to put enlargement countries in the right path, of course, to be part of the EU. But when you have looked at what happened 
particularly last year with the discussion of the Western Balkan corridor and the destabilization and even the political crisis created, then you have to ask yourself also that about the effectiveness and how, you know, the EU external action, enlargement policy, foreign policy is working and supporting that. I think we can talk also a bit about the internal security crisis and in particular the question about how far member states are sharing information when it comes like to terrorist suspects. And finally, the political and institutional crisis. I think that certain way there were questions about Schengen, how long will, will survive Schengen. Uh, there were questions about, um, there was certainly a disagreement among member states and sometimes also uncoordinated measures and national decisions and efforts. So all this uh, add, added to the complexity and uh, in this way I would pass to the second part of which is the proposal in itself on the Commission side. <coughs> and maybe to start is that, well, there was a plan to actually amend the agency, the legal framework, but it was just as a follow-up of, of our normal evaluation that you would do after five years of the functioning of the agency and then three years after and so on. But the whole situation that I just explained pushed the legislator, in this case the Commission, to make a, a, a much more ambitious proposal than probably they have thought before. Um, first point is that the idea of the European border and coast guard is much more than the agency itself. And that's maybe the most important novelty, but maybe it's conceptual. Then in practical terms, we can maybe discuss afterwards. Meaning European border and coast guard is the sum of the agency and the national member state services responsible for border management. I would draw your attention that it's not, there's not only one, but there are several national services responsible for border management activities, depending on we are talking about border checks, border surveillance, etc. I think the core of the proposal is certainly about what we can call the governance of the external borders. There are several elements on this, but I think the most important would be definitely the vulnerability assessment. The vulnerability assessment is a new tool, basically, to be carried out, a task that is to be carried out by the agency, and it looks really more in-depth into the member states' capacities to face future crises. Our approach is very much future-oriented, to, to through the assessment in full cooperation with the member states, to help them and to create more resilience and better capacities and to, to, to cope with the situations. And definitely we want to work with the with the member states fully and also with the Commission on this. And I think it is one of the elements also that might trigger what the next element, which is this urgent action or intervention, which you know probably you have here is one of the, the most delicate points, because basically it puts, us in, puts the EU in a strong position, maybe decision of the Council, of the Commission, this is something that is still being discussed based on the assessment of the agency to, in, to launch an operation in that country. But it can be, and it's not only about joint operations, and I imagine you, you're familiar a bit with the agency mandate to launch joint operations, but it can be also to have a capacity building package together with a joint operation to look and address those vulnerabilities that we have seen in, the, in that assessment. So, in any case, urgent action is, is one of those important elements, of course, that touches on the sovereignty as of the member states. In any case, it is clear that this will not happen, an operation in a member state without the agreement of that member state. That's, I think, very clear. Then, another important element is the pools. Here, meaning pools is the pools of border guards, pools of equipment that the agency already is having. We are doing this already for, in several of the amendments of the agency done before and in our activities. The only thing is that, let's say like this, the, the Commission has the legislators taking a new step to make them more compulsory, more binding for the member states. Well, let's say like a compulsory pooling and sharing mechanism, where the agency will have more grip on the national resources. Because actually the agency itself, we have around 300, 400 staff members, so we don't have really the border guards and not meant to send border guards. I mean, it's not our staff, and certainly not me, the one who is going to be at the external borders uh, controlling this. This remains the member state responsibility. But with the pools, we want to support the member states and having more grip, more capacity. And with this um, rapid pool or standing corps, whatever you want to call it, certainly will increase our capacity and also the possibility to manage better 
to have a more capacity in selecting the right people with the right profile and also being even able to, to somehow evaluate together with the member state to which uh, this person, this border guard that is part of this European border guard teams belong to evaluate the performance and, and have an idea about when and uh, guide, let's say like this, the next deployment of, of these members. And at the end, as part of the governance, and it's maybe unfair to put it at the end because it should be somehow at the top, is this uh, in legal definition that the proposal, commission proposal contains on what is integrated border management. This is a term that is, has been somehow politically defined in council conclusions before, I think December 2006, but there is not a proper legal defici definition. You have, of course, in the, in the Treaty of the Function of European Union, a legal basis for the legislator to adopt measures for the integrated management of the external borders. But there is not a legal definition. So the novelty here is that this new regulation, this new founding regulation of the agency would include a definition and also give a special role of the agency in developing a technical operational strategy. It is, as I say, the strategy itself quite a strategic issue because, of course, this is a, an, an, a basis also for the member states and that member states would have to follow this technical and operational strategy. So it is sensitive for the member states because we have seen that there are maybe different even understandings on how this EBM, IBM strategy should look like and what are the components and so on. In any case, the, the, it is clear that the proposal, as in many other aspects, is really making a step forward, a very positive step, and including a definition on this. Apart from this aspect or chapter on governance of external borders, there is another one very important, which is on the more migration management. Because we have to see border management is not an end in itself. Let's uh, forget about that and border control an end. It is supporting migration management, it's supporting internal security. You can even say it's supporting the economic relations and the free trade and the movement of people. So it's not about, you know, border security, or at least not only that. And the, 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 the Commission proposal in this sense on the migration management part has certainly also important parts. First, this migration management support teams. In fact, what the Commission there has established nothing new because we are doing it already. In Greece and Italy, we have massively deployed experts, member states experts and border guards to support the host member state, Greece and Italy in this case, in the hotspots for a registration identification tasks, which are national tasks, according to Eurotag, as you mentioned, Eurotag regulation or other pieces of EU law. This is national Schengen border code, the identification of the third country national is a national task. But we saw that there was a gap there and we supported that. So basically that's institutionalizing or formalizing that task. But there's also in return, we are doing something like joint return operations. We also had some capacity building activities, but the new step is here actually, and I think my colleagues sometimes tell me it's not really the right word, national return operations. But the idea is that the agency can ha now not only support several member states who have returnees to go to the same third country back, but just one particular member state also by providing uh, additional, well, all type of support. Of course, the return, the charter flight maybe, but also in terms of identification and documentation, because one of the most difficult parts in the return process is the documentation. In that sense, the cooperation of the third country. And um, I think that uh, certainly we will be, as, as Alexander Sorel said earlier, we will be talking a lot about return in the next uh, months and years because it's a very important element and it's sustaining all the rest, even the asylum policy. So it is, it is an, 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 a key aspect and where definitely the agency wants to also play its role according to the new, new mandate. And then <clears throat> there's a bit of more heter heterogeneous area. I mean, how would I say, combining uh, in, 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 in the commission proposal, extending already a mandate that the agency has today in different areas. The first one, and I would like to mention, is the Coast Guard. There is a new article on the so-called Coast Guard functions. I'm not sure how familiar you are with Coast Guard functions because it's a term that the, H the Commission proposal has not 
defined in the proposal itself, but in several policy, uh, commission policy documents on integrated maritime policy they, and uh, the common information sharing environment, they have started to define a bit what the functions are. Well, you have a total of 11 functions. I will not now mention all of them for maritime safety, fisheries control, search and rescue, very important, but also law enforcement related functions. Of course, border control, which the agency has already, but also other aspects like customs enforcement in sea or some law enforcement related info. Uh, uh, law enforcement related functions like for example the fight against trafficking of trucks, smuggling of weapons which is also very important for the internal security. So the new, the new mandate and what the Commission actually the proposed new mandate uh, would allow us to increase our cooperation not only with the EU maritime agencies but also with some of the national authorities that implement some of those Coast Guard functions. Coming back you can imagine how Difficulty is sometimes dealing with the search and rescue one. This is dealt with international law, it's regulated by international law. But uh, certainly many, as you know, probably know most of our joint operations in Greece and Italy end up in search and rescue operations. So the, this function is very present in our minds. Uh, still in, in the area of cooperation, we, our mandate will be also enforced in the terms of cooperation with all the law enforcement bodies uh, like Europol, our mandate to process personal data will also probably be enlarged. All this, of course, as I said earlier in the discussion, at least under the Commission proposal. Our mandate to cooperate with customs, which we didn't have, strange enough, customs is the other main authority, national authority present at the external borders. And that was not really regulated in our founding regulations so far, cooperation with customs. So now, finally, we have it, at least in the Commission proposal. And finally, and which is a very um, also sensitive area, is the cooperation with third country authorities. We have working arrangements, which are not international agreements with third countries. This is just a sort of administrative arrangement, cooperation agreement arrangement. But the new uh, the Commission proposal at least would help us to use some of the tools that we are using currently in the EU context, in the EU member states or Schengen associated countries export them into the third country. So we have, for instance, the mandate, as I said, to launch joint operation at external borders, at the EU member state external borders. But the Commission proposes actually to do also the possibility, of course, with the agreement of the third country, the non-EU country, to do it somehow on the other side of the border. Because we are working together with the member states on the EU side of the border, on the member state side. But then it would help also to work on the other side. There are also ideas and proposals to also have a closer cooperation with the third countries in the field of return and so on. But anyway, this is, um, this is one of, of course, important topic. As you can imagine, also discussed in the, in the ongoing trialogue and uh, we will see how it looks at, uh, at the end. Now to, to come to the final part, analysis of the proposal. I mean, first of all, and I also ask in the title to have a bit of uh, showing, first of all, a bit that this is an evolution. Since I worked in Frontex, this is like nine years, and even I was working before in the Commission, I have seen many amendments already, well, at least four or five amendments, taking different pieces of EU secondary legislation to their tasks of the agency. So I see this as an, as an evolution. Doing any analysis, proper analysis now is not also adequate because they're still ongoing in the, in the political legislative process. But I think some, some key ideas which I would like and can also maybe inspire some questions that uh, could come up. Um, first, we could ask, is there an evolution now from the sovereignty centered based, I mean sovereignty, sovereignty sorry, principle to a more solidarity principle when it comes to border management? And here what I would think is what I mean with solidarity is more sharing of member states' resources to support that member state exposed. So more compulsory, if I can say, pooling and sharing, but also more integration among the national border management services through the activities of the agency. So solidarity in that sense. Is there also an evolution from, again, sovereignty to shared responsibility in terms of border management? And here, of course, questions you would ask, how do you understand shared responsibility? Well, you, you have anyway the Article 5 of the Commission proposal, and you can look at it. But uh, is it something meant like, okay, 
the agency is responsible for this, the member states are responsible for that. You will see that's a bit the approach somehow that the Commission took in the proposal, saying in normally member states are responsible for the control of the external borders, but then if, and don't quote me exactly, but they said something like, uh, in extraordinary circumstances uh, and uh, crisis situations, somehow the responsibility will go to the agency or to the EU. Uh, anyway, that would be, I, I would also raise the question whether, how can we say, understand shared responsibility as joint responsibility in the control of the external borders? Because uh, certain elements, and I'm sure you will develop on that, about accountability and responsibility and, and who, uh, it is, is important and also surely picked up uh, in, the, in this uh, last phase of the discussions among the legislators about elements on accountability. So uh, in our activities, national activities, and in particular on the aspect also of uh, fundamental rights compliance. But uh, it's important also to just remind you what the agency does not do and what we are not responsible. As I see, it a bit like the ceiling in terms of responsibility. I mean, when we say, we are not responsible for the control of external borders, so at least I say that remains with the member states. What I'm thinking immediately is that if you're refusing entry to a third country national, if you're accepting that third country national and uh, lodging, registering the asylum application and referring it, if you're taking that vulnerable person and put it in custody or with a certain NGO, this can be only, in my opinion, a national member state's decision. I don't see how the agency of the EU can replace. We're talking about the fate of that person, the destiny of the person, once it's in the EU. So certain person, or a certain member state, I think, or entity has to take responsibility. I don't see how the EU can take responsibility for that. The same would be on return decisions. Even if we have a stronger mandate on return, return decision, the decision to expel someone, going through the procedure, coming to that last end, it remains a national decision. It's not. Uh, don't see how the EU can really take that decision. That's at least in my opinion. And, um, and I think finally, there's clearly an evolution of the agency. That's clear in, in the new mandate. But uh, that has to be looked also in terms of maybe the role of the management board. Our management board, at least according to the Commission proposal, will have some important a very much important role that would go a bit beyond that management board that is only a governing board for the agency, but somehow a management board that is taking important decisions that refer to the governance of the external borders. We're talking about its role in the vulnerability assessment, uh, in the IBM strategy, etc., etc., because the management board will decide on that. Uh, so that's very much it, maybe as final conclusion, and the main message is that Border management, of course, is not equal to migration management. Migration management is very much a large area, and, uh, and uh, you know it very well. And therefore, you know, putting and putting the, making a proposal for European border and Coast Guard is an important step, but it's not something in itself that will the panacea and that will solve the problems, or all the problems, is one instrument. Finally, in, and this is my opinion, personal opinion, it's also that the most important political challenges remain, or the most important challenge actually, and questions are uh, political, and I will mention already, legal migration, do we need legal migration, do we want legal migration? Also the asylum, do we will find a system for sharing the asylum, fair system to share the burden of the asylum seekers among the EU? And even will we find the proper legal access to the territory, channels, legal channels? Resettlement is one, but certainly I think we have to look a bit beyond. And finally, foreign policies, and mentioned, what is the capacity to impact in our neighborhood and project our security also on migration interest, our EU interest, because migration and home affairs interests are EU policy objectives and EU interest in our, in our foreign policy. And finally, about whether, you know, we want more EU or less EU and all those things. So, anyway, so that's, uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.